with Bill Oglesby. He's an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University who also uh, teaches journalism, law, and ethics. I am with Silver Persinger as well. He's a longtime citizen journalist who posts full video coverage of city government meetings and events at richmondtelegraph.org. Is that right? Dot org? That's great. Excellent. And for years, he's been bridging the divide between citizen and journalist. And I'm also with Ned Oliver. He's an associate editor at Style Weekly who covers Richmond government and politics, um, as the two are, of course, very distinct. And I'm also, or maybe, with Charlie Deardor. He's my co-host and a frequent commentator on city politics. Everybody, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. And wanted to start, as we said earlier, with Silver, um, talking a little bit about you and how you came to what you do. Um, and what you do is... Uh, when I talk to people in the community, and we were talking about this before we went on air, Charlie was saying that... It's an invaluable service that you provide to the citizens of this city because some of them can't go to the meetings at 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You record those meetings, you, you, you upload them, and, and people are then therefore informed. Yeah, and, and what's uh, interesting, real quick, before we let Silver talk a little bit about what he, exactly it is and why he does it, it, he records just about any and every committee meeting and, and subcommittee meeting that he's able to get to. Is that about right, right, Silver? That's correct. I missed today's committee meeting, but it was a light agenda. Forgivable. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of got involved and just interested in the city government because of Sixth Street Marketplace and them wanting to tear it down and I thought that was like... So how long ago would this have been? Because of course we're still dealing with exactly that issue today. Um, so it sounds like you got involved, what, about a week ago? Uh, 2000, 2001, like right around Progress. that time. Or, or, you know, actually it was like the terrorist attacks that kind of motivated, motivated me to like get involved in my government because I saw the tax is kind of like the result of my government. Hmm. So uh, local government's the best place for that. And uh, I think pretty early on I wanted to start like a newspaper because I wanted to like help people know what was going on at the city council meetings. Did you not feel like what we had in town was enough? No, because once you start attending the meetings you see that newspaper people only pick like one or two or three at the most things to talk about. And there's so many important things that are discussed like at every meeting. And if you look at these issues of The Crow that I did, I basically report everything that happened. Every, was The Crow the newspaper that you did? Yeah, it was okay. just a double-sided 11 by 17 folded okay. in the quarters. How, how long did you? But it was dense. I only did two issues. I did okay. October 2003 and November 2003. Okay. But uh, I'll, I'll share the link with you later. Cool. Are you, so they're uploaded now to mm -hmm. to your to your site. Okay. So. Oh, they're they're somewhere. They're six hour <laughs> six hour day dot org slash. Uh, well, I don't know what it is. Cut that out. <laughs> Dad, let me ask you something. When did you start writing and why? Uh, geez, I think I started writing seriously in two thousand eight. Okay. And I just couldn't think of a better idea of something that I'd like to do for a living. And so I just approached a local newspaper in my hometown, Lexington, Virginia, and asked the editor if he'd give me an assignment, and he sent me to the local Soil and Water Conservation District's annual awards banquet. And wow, he was trying to discourage you, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, he, here, <laughs> try this one for size. <laughs> we will never see you again. I, I came back, and he was like, it's probably better if you don't write it in chronological order, but <laughs> it will help you out a little. And, and it so kind of snowballed from there. I got my first check. They paid 10 cents an inch, so I got like, you know, a dollar or something. It was crazy. And it's gotten better for me. I'd like to sketch out. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, we'll get to you in a second, but you're not active in writing or, or, or production anymore in the public venue. So I want to ask these guys really quickly, and then we'll drill down. Is it, what is it that motivates you? Is it still that desire to let people know what's going on? Do you love it? Both of you can take this one. I mean, because I've noticed I've got friends in the press who you don't make that much money. It's got to be gratifying on another level. Talk about that for a minute, please. Uh, no, that's that's true. It's it's fun. I think it's fun too. It's like a soap opera when you get to know these people, and uh, you know, my main interest is uh, transparency, open government, and encouraging citizen citizen participation. And so uh, I try to practice what I preach, and uh, 
that's that's what I'm preaching is uh, the open government. So what what I try to do with with my comments at the city council meetings is to let people know what's going on. But I feel like there's a lot that probably goes on that I don't really understand, especially like you know renegotiating renegotiating bond stuff to get lower interest rates supposedly to save the city money. There's all kinds of weird financial things that go on that are probably not good, but I just don't understand. So I just try to do the best with what I. So real quick, what's interesting about the two of you, we have both of you here at the table, and if I were to go to the city council meeting on Monday night, last Monday, I would find the two of you sitting right close by. In, next to one another. Right, right next to one another. Hard to tell the two of you apart because you both have beards. Um, and you would hey, be hey, here hey, in the hey, press hey, box. I'm not going to tolerate that kind <laughs> of talk here. Beards. Um, so you'd be there together. One of you... Uh, is a paid journalist, and the other of you is an unpaid journalist. Um, is there, in the eyes of either one of you, and I'm asking this as somebody who is a journalist and a working journalist, is there, in your eyes, any difference between the two of you in terms of who is a journalist and who is a journalist? I, I think there's a difference because I don't really consider myself a journalist. I consider myself more of a, a community archivist or something like that, and I'm just trying to preserve the meetings, and sometimes I do try to write little summarizing paragraphs, but sometimes I'm just so swamped in video, I don't even have the time to do that. So it's it's a real challenge making time, because I would like to write articles and uh, tag them with all the keywords to make the videos more usable in the future for people that are doing research, but I just don't have the, the time to do that. Ned? Yeah, and, and it's that's that's interesting. I'm in a position where I'm sort of accountable to my editors and have to meet deadlines and you know do things to fill the paper. So I'm maybe accountable in a, a bit of a different way. Um, but at the same time, at a paper like Style, I kind of have some freedom and get to write about you know whatever I think is particularly interesting at a given moment. So yeah. I mean, do you do you see a distinction between you and Silver at that table? <laughs> Uh, n not a terribly important one, I guess. Uh, I the I write for style, and he writes for his you know website blog, video site. And now clearly, there's entree to talk a little bit to Bill um, about who is a journalist. I mean, that, that was <laughs> the question is... I was getting ready to get after Bill, and that is this: it's a bit early in the conversation to do this, but what is a journalist? It's it's um it's it can who be almost it? anybody, depending on why you're asking you know if you ask the individuals well, it can be it can be nearly anyone especially today because everybody has um, it's not just that everybody has the tools to write but everybody can distribute it I mean it, 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 for all intents and purposes anything that we ever use to to uh, to um, to measure what a journalist is by traditional means we have now um, uh, and everybody has, but the problem is when you start trying to determine who a journalist is for some official purpose, that's when we get into a real argument and a real, uh, or at least some real controversy over who is a journalist and who's not. As a professor uh, and someone who studies journalism and someone who actually was a journalist at one point, um, working journalist. a working journalist, um, I'd like to ask this question. It's a very pointed question. I did some research today talking to some folks uh, in journalism here in Richmond. And one of them said, a journalist is someone who has to go through the editing process. And you had mentioned that earlier in your comments, Ned. Would you agree with that or would you disagree with that in the modern age from your position as a professor? Do you have to be someone who goes, do you have to be a writer who goes through the editing process and has an editor? Uh, look at your work before it's published to qualify as a journalist or is a blogger who self-edits three or four times before that piece is posted a journalist as well you know I, I don't <clears throat> I don't see why I'm, uh, the fact that it goes to an editor needs to be the definition you use for a journalist in fact that's that's one of many that people have tried to use over the years uh, they've used uh, being associated in some way with a reputable organization or an established organization as being one measure of the journalist. 
uh, whether one receives a substantial part of one's income from writing is another way that people have used to define a journalist. But the truth of the matter is that that leaves out a lot of people today, um, like Silver, who, who maybe uh, spend a good deal of time working as uh, a, doing everything that a, that a traditional journalist does and taking it very seriously and yet may not make any substantial income at any point over that. The, the Ned's got the secondary on. question I have, I want to follow no, up on that one matter. second. <laughs> I want to follow up on that because the, another point got brought up in, in, in my research and that is this. If Ned has a, Ned being the working journalist who's earning his living doing this at the table, if Ned has a... Well, just well, I'm delineating who I'm talking about here, okay? I'm defining who I'm speaking about. <laughs> if, if you've got a lead from somebody and it has import on a criminal case and the judge asks you, this is right up your, in your bailiwick, Bill, if the judge asks you to give up your, your, your source and you say no, then you have a, a constitutional right to say no. Is that same constitutional right afforded to silver? Uh, uh, real quick, Charlie, I'm going to answer that one. There's nothing that protects me or Ned or Silver or anybody at this table um, that's right. when it comes to a source. That's, right. that's a that's a fallacy. The okay. idea Virginia is actually one of Sorry, too many, only ten too states. Too many iron sides. I watched way too many iron sides. <laughs> <laughs> well, Virginia is one of only ten states that actually has no shield law protecting journalists. There are 40 states that do. Oh, there are states that do have it. Okay, 40 states. 40 out of the 50. But it, does that apply in, in federal court? No, no, it does not. Um, so uh, that won't help you there either. But but uh, but there is a general, of course, there's a, a general principle that states can give um, states can give more rights than are granted under the Constitution. So the Supreme Court's never been willing to to say that there is any. Um, right under the First Amendment to for a journalist to withhold information that any other citizen would have to give up, but individual states are allowed to give more rights and 40 of them have done so. The Federalist Papers and Federalism visit us on RVA Report. Yeah. Ned, you had something to say and I sort of blocked you there. Well, I was just going to note that the, the definition, that trying to use the editing process as a definition would also leave out working journalists or journalism that some working journalists do and you consider tweets um, aren't edited, and they're definitely a way of disseminating news now that is very popular. I would add, add to fun? that. I would add to that small shop newspapers. I mean, there's there are papers in the state that are a person. Um, mm -hmm. A good example of that would probably be the the. Oh, oh. sorry, I touched something. Please hold. <laughs> are we okay? No, we're not okay. You touched something. Why would you go and do that? I did that. My hand bumped it. Okay. An example of that would be uh, when you look at, at the locally here at the Chesterfield Observer and Tom Lapis. Tom right now is a, a single man shop for the most part. He's got a freelancer now and then, but I mean he, he writes, edits himself. So you'd be counting, discounting people who, you know, to all people who are looking from the outside look like a journalist. Okay. Well, I think it's important to remember that this constitutionally protected right is guaranteed to all of us and it's an individual right. So that's yeah, something we can all assert. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I was looking earlier today at, at the, the, I guess, the, the original document that we worry about with this is the First Amendment. And of course, it's Congress shall pass no laws uh, that restrict, and among the various, it's, uh, what is it? It's the press, freedom mm -hmm. of the press. Um, I mean, by some definitions, I was asking students uh, in my classes, what does that mean? I had one person say, well, it means that you own a press. Um, which means that it, anything that's digital or, or, or sound or, or uh, video is not the press. Um, which, I, you know, in a weird way, it might be an argument to be made for that. Um, some of these other mediums are, are entertainment and cross over 
very much so. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing, is that, you know, the, the law always runs years behind society. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. I mean, when we go back to the Industrial Revolution of the late 19th century, you know, it was the 1930s, you know, some 40 years later or more before we started having regulatory codes to really react to the fact that all of a sudden you've got mass production of goods and they're being they're being shipped many many miles so you can't just go to your to your you know um, local general store and complain and have somebody local who made that product make it right for you you know it took years and years for the law to react to that the same thing is happening today and we see it over and over and over again uh, far beyond the the issues we're talking about right now but we you know we just had we had this sexting issue going on and you know how do you treat that? Is that child pornography? Well, no, it's not under the, it, it, it's not under what people were thinking at the times those laws were passed, but they are, they're all we have right now because the law hasn't caught up yet. And so, again, there, that's a, a media outlet as well, isn't right. it? So, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all very confusing. It's sort of the, there's an app for that, uh, has become the source of our biggest problem in defining what we are, who we are, what the tools are that we use. Um, you know, is it a flashlight or a newspaper that's in my pocket right now, or am I going to get a phone call on it? Um, it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, there's just, um, you know, if we could, if we could agree, we really couldn't even before. We've never really been able to agree what a journalist is. You know, it, it made a big, it, it's made a big difference traditionally to the courts. The fact that we don't have any specific training to be a journalist and we don't have any specific licensure and we don't we don't have to be uh, judged by our peers uh, in any kind of formal way all of those things we don't have to have continuing education or that sort of thing all of those things made a big difference uh, at one time uh, now that's even more true that 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 we we don't have those things um, and in a sense that's more in keeping with the spirit of America, I would argue, that, that, that we can have people who can actually can reach other people who, who don't have any particular, any particular stake in the game other than the fact that they want to, they want to do it. Um, I think it would be really presumptuous to say that those people are not journalists. They are journalists. It's just that um, um, we're not exactly sure where to draw the line and, and, and uh, it probably depends on what specific topic we're talking about. Does the line need to be drawn? You know, in your obvious, opinion. Well, I think I think when I think when you're talking about something like taking uh, being extended the privilege um, to, for instance, not give information when you're requested that that some other court could demand, and and allowing a journalist, at least in some states, to say no, I choose not to do that because I have this confidential relationship uh, that I've, uh, a confidential agreement, um, um, you know, I think then one could argue that it's important to, to in some way be able to distinguish um, those who can take it from those who shouldn't be able to, otherwise that it just becomes something that anybody can take, but I don't know how you do that either. Ned and Silver. What do you think? Is should a line be drawn, or can a line be drawn? I'd maybe start with you, Ned, because I'd really like to talk to Silver about something leading off of that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it only strikes me as important, and uh, two instances come to mind. And one is the the issue of a, a potential shield law, and the other is allocating finite resources, such as space in a press gallery or you know other such things, which we saw recently. Right. Issue. Well, there wasn't necessarily a space issue. That might not be the best example of this. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I, you know, it's truly not something. It's I, I don't know. I think that what Silver does is totally, you know, as valid as what I do. I wouldn't want to be the one who had to make that decision. I am curious to know a little bit more about how the states that do have shield laws. I, I was thinking the exact same thing: is how do you apply that to just a, a again a citizen journalist who maybe gets on to a big story? It, and you know there are Silver. You're probably a good example of this. Actually, you're somebody who's found a way in your day to do far more than gosh just about anybody else could do. 
Um, even Ned and I, you know, when I was a full-time, all-the-time reporter, Ned today, who is a full-time, all-the-time reporter, um, you know, you pointed out Ned's not at every meeting. He's not at every, uh, you know, subcommittee meeting. You're there. So you've taken the time and have committed yourself to doing this, and there are people who will commit themselves to exactly that on, most of the time it's a single issue. Like, for instance, I don't know, baseball, which is a big issue right now here, or uh, the, the uh, park, or Once Canal. Again, ladies Canal. and gentlemen, we couldn't go through know, a whole hour without through. mentioning baseball, baseball on RBA report. <laughs> Kanawa, Kanawa um, uh, what are we calling it? Kanawa Green or whatever, um, you know, is another one that right now is a, it's, it's sort of a single issue thing that's, that some people, as citizen journalists, will latch onto it and will report the heck out of. And you could foresee somebody getting into one of those single issue stories and really reporting the heck out of it and getting something that law enforcement might be interested in. Oh um, yeah, and, and the, the, the um, you mentioned, you know, what are the states that have shield laws doing? Um, I can tell you that New Jersey, for instance, uh, in um, just a few years ago, I think 2010, they had uh, they had a case where they were trying to decide if a blogger was a journalist for the purposes of the state shield law, and the two things, and I think we really mentioned both of them earlier, that they said would would perhaps distinguish that in their in, in their judgment would be, are they connected with a a journalism organization, an organization that 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 its business is journalism. And two, do they derive any income from that? Now, they're not saying that if they don't, that they're that they're somehow not legitimate journalists. But they are saying that if they if they don't do either of those, then they might very well not be able to take advantage of the state shield. I wanted to ask um, Silver something. It's it's actually just sort of laying something bare for us to talk about for a moment, and that is this: nothing anyone ever says in front of you when the camera runs, is off the record, is it? Um, I, I don't know, sometimes I don't have my camera on, then it's off the record. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't, if somebody says, hey, uh, can, the, can, can you not post that or something, I, I'll honor people's requests. Oh, also, okay. if people want videos removed, I do that all the time. Okay. Uh, a lot of times I have film stand-up comedy, not so much anymore, but sometimes people are applying for jobs and they don't want their bosses to find them doing some lewd stand-up comedy. So uh, I'll I'll take I'll take their names I'll take their names off the description and tag and then uh, make it private for six months. And usually people are cool with it going back up just as long as their name's not on it. So therefore, it's not searchable, and that's good until uh, Google develops a way to text search videos. <laughs> but you, but it's you kind of have you. It's Google. Everything's coming with Google. Um, and by the way, those stand-up videos were pretty entertaining. I watched a couple of them. Yeah, I want to do more. So, sorry, Charlie. But no, and, and so, Ned, you have interviewees say to you, this is off the record, or this is on background, and you have a determination as to whether to honor that or not, not honor it, whether to accept the, the terms uh, and conditions that the interviewee has, has put on that statement that is about to come out. You sort of blew me out of the water, Silver, because what I, I truly value, and I think a lot of citizens should value about what you do, is that it's edited, but it's in its rawest form. I mean, there's a committee meeting, and your camera is on, and you've got... Oh, well, that's all on the record. The whole meeting is on the record. Sometimes I will excerpt like a 10 second silence while somebody's walking from but otherwise it's basically an unedited meeting you know and I, I've been using two cameras for the last few months and that makes the I think the video is a lot more dynamic there's no swinging of the camera to give cause viewers motion sickness right. so it's, it just makes a more professional product and also I lately I've been go, going through their sound system like recording that on an external device and then syncing it with the videos later and that makes them sound much better. You know, you could have probably worked out some sort of sponsorship with Dramamine when you didn't have the, the two cameras. <laughs> Are you an activist? <laughs> yes. I, I consider myself a citizen advocate. Does that in any way change the definition of journalist, Bill? 
No, I don't think so at all. I mean, we again, we've had we've had advocacy journalism for right. forever. I mean, the first you know first pamphleteers obviously were advocates. So no, I don't think that that has anything to do with. Yeah, it's all. funny. It's funny, Chris, because in in Britain. Uh, especially, I don't know now, but in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I don't know how far back all that went, but in Britain, the editors or publishers of newspapers, in fact, were for one government or the other government. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was made quite clear. My, my question was actually going in that direction because, of course, uh, you know... Because great minds talking, think alike. Talking, talking <laughs> with my... <laughs> or, uh, yeah, mediocre minds think exactly yeah, alike mediocre. as well. <laughs> so, I'm at the zenith of a mediocre <laughs> career, Ben. Well, and speaking of which, the zenith was uh, um, Ben Franklin's son's newspaper. And he was exact. That that was great minds thinking alike. By the way, the, you, the fact that you used that word. Um, <laughs> so uh, his paper was, I think, torched a couple of times because he was very much a partisan uh, newspaper editor and mm -hmm. publisher. Um, and this is uh, a history. In fact, I think that newspapers, uh, newspaper wars today, are just battling it out over over who's listening or watching or reading. It, which back then it was potentially actually a war in oh, some yeah. cases. I mean, you know, you know, Hearst, I mean, you know, Cuba, all mm -hmm. that. Right. I mean, we're... Uh, we're that kind of war, too. Yeah, I, I was I mean, talking about, like, going exactly. back to the 1700s. Right. But I guess all the way into, uh, again, Cuba, that's uh, the 1960s. Right. But, but, what I, but what I mean is our, our modern concept of, of um, impartial journalism is just that, for the most part, a pretty modern concept. Doesn't that really kind of, that, that trend or whatever we want to call it, a, a tradition begins really in the 40s and 50s, right? Probably, I mean, for largely. I mean, the, 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 we had it, but we had it before then. But but even then, I mean, you, you see that if you go back and you read the old papers that that considered themselves impartial at the time, they had their, you know, they, they had their 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 favorites, and they they were leaning a certain way in many cases. It's just, in many ways, that's been a, a popular fiction. But but for whatever reason, the the fact of the matter is that is that um, advocacy is very, very much a part of journalism and always has been. Oh, Silver. Uh, yeah, I work with old newspapers, and I think that might be part of how I got interested in doing this, too. Actually reading the old city council reports where they and kind of listed everything that happened at the meeting. I thought that was, like, really awesome because you could see the whole meeting just from reading, you know, a few lines of text. And... Uh, so real quick, you're saying that, that those older newspapers would, would actually show sort of what Ned was not supposed to do when he went to the yeah, yeah, water school order. Exactly. <laughs> they, they did that. But, uh, you know, we have this book written by this guy named Cappen, and in the 20s or 30s, he kind of went around Virginia and tried to make up a list of all the newspapers that ever exist in Virginia. And, he, you know, he would list its circulation, where it was from. He even wrote a little bit of, like, some of the... In industries of the locality, but he also listed the political affiliation of the newspaper, and every mm -hmm. paper had a political affiliation. You know, the Times Dispatch, Tony uh, uh, Silvestri, he serves on the board of Venture Richmond, and he and they're endorsing the ballpark plan. You know, what kind of conflict of interest is that? Is it a conflict of interest? I guess I what we're saying is. here is that that uh, would it be, Bill? Well, <clears throat> I mean. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard to say. It's, it's hard for me to sit here and say that you know what has gone into it because, of course, they're they're set up in such a way that supposedly their their uh, editorial board it operates very independently from not just from the the news side but from you know I mean they're they're sort of part of management but it's still you know that that management's not dictating you'll you'll take this stand on on this issue but you know I. You know, for what, it, however you see it, I mean, the fact of the matter is that you know, in many, in mo, in most, um, in most professions where we really don't want there to be, for instance, the judicial profession, you know, they, we would say that the judicial officers probably shouldn't um, endorse something that that uh, venture Richmond does or this kind of thing because they're supposed to. It's not just a matter of, of not being in favor of one over another, but it's uh, one side over another, but not presenting an appearance that they do that. 
um, you know, I don't know that uh, I don't know that it's a, a conflict of interest because if they're open about the fact that they're doing it, it's just what they do. And it's a confluence of interest. <laughs> confluence <laughs> right, right. of interest. That, that's well one. Point. I'm well going to use that one in class. <laughs> well, I like that. So in looking back at all these, and that was, I, that was actually where I kind of wanted to, to go with it before, is you, you see this. You can see the history of Virginia and Virginia newspapers and this tradition. That was something that you wanted to sort of pick up in what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was really cool. And uh, it's how you envisioned the crow? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, reading it, you know, 10 years later or something, I'm like, wow, this is really great. And because it's like the whole meeting. It's like, also it's like entertaining too. And you learn lots of, that's one of the things I like best about going to meetings is you learn everything that's going on in the city as far as the government's concerned and makes you really informed about about your city and school. One of these days we'll all figure out something about all these bond re, re, <laughs> reissuances, et cetera, and understand it. Yeah, right? hopefully. We need some economic people going to these meetings. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Ned looks like you wanted to say something. Uh, I'm wondering if I can connect this thought, but I've, I've also been reading um, some of the old newspapers that Silver's been putting online, and, and one of the things that struck me is we're talking about, you know, the, the disagreement that kind of sparked this conversation. It was asserted, well, I report on Facebook, I report on YouTube, and you look back at, you know, these old newspapers, and they also had social columns, mm -hmm. and it would be like, Mary Sue went to New York, um, Joe Bob is visiting, his grandmother in the holler, uh, there were long lists. This is actually the advertising section for criminals, local criminals. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but <laughs> in any case, there, there was a lot of social news, and actually, you know, uh, some newspapers still do that. In, in, in large part, Facebook has replaced that. That's a source of social news. So mm -hmm. I, I think that you could say you're reporting for Facebook <laughs> in a way. I don't know. I was, you know, I was, I was um, talking with somebody recently uh, with the um, People's Library one of the, the founders of the People's Library here in, in, in Richmond, uh, I think it was Courtney was telling me about this, Courtney Bowles. And uh, so it was talking about something they're doing in a Virginia prison. I think it's in Virginia. It might be in another state. But in this prison where they're, they're at, there's uh, some issue with, with uh, how people are communicating into the prison. And the people, local folks, began using the radio station as a way to communicate information back and forth into the prison. Um, it was just a local music station played like hip hop or something like that, and it uh, became a way to communicate other information into the prison other than just entertainment. Um, it became really a sole source of information for some of those families, and direct line of it, it like almost a Facebook or, a, or an email uh, method of communication of the prison for, for people. And that's not the press, obviously, but in a way it kind of is a little micro. It's media. Yeah, it's media. Radio is media. And, and I mean that's a bizarre sort of, of example of a very low tech version of, of you know almost a Facebook kind of thing. We're it, I mean it's a very interesting time we're in um, with regards to you know how do we define who we are and what we are and um, I don't know I mean I look at Charlie over here at the other end of the table who I you know would never have thought of as a, as a journalist um, you know in a past life but now every week he's doing a radio show. And you know, I like to think we do pretty good content. And you know, I almost want to ask Charlie if he considers himself to be a journalist. I actually started RVA Report, um, and, and we still hold the web address for it as a uh, new news aggregation and opinion uh, page. Um, and uh, you know, life being what it is, things got busy, and it, it morphed into this radio show. But at one point or another, yeah, we do hope to—I do hope to make this thing a, a web page whereby people can go there and, and, and take a look at what's going on that day or that week. Um, and it would be a news aggregation site similar to, and I'll be honest, um, with their blessing. I, I talked to a few people. Uh, this is this came from Connecticut Capital Report, which is a website that is set up like a Drudge website. Uh, it's not set up in a right-wing fashion. It's set up on that format, I'm saying. It's set up like a Drudge website, and they have a TV show called Connecticut Capital Report. Uh, and they Say that uh, fast. Yeah, three times. <laughs> uh, and they host folks like the guests we've got, uh, and except they're more balanced as far as it's always politics, it's always Connecticut politics, it's always capital politics, 
and there's always two Democrats and two Republicans just tearing each other to pieces, and it makes great, great TV. I mean, they're, they're friends, but it's it's crossfire for Friends. Connecticut. Friends. And is and is I've been doing politics in this town since I was 19 years old, uh, and whether it was statewide stuff, helping candidates, or or locally, or even running. One thing I love about Virginia is it's politics 24-7. We have off-year elections, so therefore we are politics 24-7. And especially here at the city level, Chris. I mean, at the municipal level, I think you're happy you're here, Ned, right now, because, you know, this is a new, this is a dearth of news constantly. There's, a, there's always something going on. Something, somebody's always saying something smart or dumb, right? That's so, true. Yeah, and so you've got something to report on. <laughs> you just did on. that lean in. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, you can't, I, I know, I know you're not see this in radio, like you're not supposed to try to tell people what something looks like or paint a picture, but he just keeps leaning into the microphone. Yes. Um, <laughs> this isn't a congressional hearing. You're not <laughs> smart. That's you're what not, it reminds me not, <laughs> No one swore you to an oath, but that's okay. That's uh, what I was going for. Come on, guys, give me some credit. <laughs> <laughs> He leaned in again. Um, but, yeah, I mean, th I wanted to, in the same vein that Silver does his thing, I wanted to offer, and I still do want to offer, a quick hit sort of a website where people could come get the news, uh, the political news of the day in Virginia and in Richmond, uh, or Virginia-specific news and Richmond-specific news, uh, political news, not, not weather and sports, you know. Just political, pure political news, because this city is very political, okay. and it has been for a long time. So you know who, I, it's just occurred to me, who's not at the table, who probably should be at the table as we expand out our definition of who is a journalist, is somebody from the PR profession. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was a Knight Foundation report that was, what was that, it was, uh, would have been about seven years ago now, that was looking at new media and who is you know, important to information aggregation in, in a community. And one of the things that they I th strongly identified was things like you know your local botanical garden website telling you when it's time to plant your crops or whatever it is that they're telling you or what now grows in your zone. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another example of something they use. I think that was actually an example from from the, the report was you know how how what seems like. You know, it's just you know PR information, and I had an interesting debate. This was while I was still a style um, with the PR person for the Richmond Police Department, who insisted that in the future there would be no need, absolutely no need for newspaper because the police department and all of these various other government functions could handle it themselves. They were putting all of this information online already, so why do we have journalists? A police officer told you that well, we didn't need a journalists. PR okay. Gosh, I feel already feel more comfortable in my skin tonight. <laughs> if you Gosh, ever, I can't wait to get tired and go to sleep. And there you should see the blank stares on the other side of the Really? It's, really? It's, 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 if you've ever read a, a more than a few city press releases, you'll know that that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> or at least maybe not going to work for you. Hey, Ned, talk about the press. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, talk about the press. Not the relationship itself, but the operation, the press operation at City Hall. Um, and you don't have to it? have an opinion on it, just tell us about Ooh, it. Well, I'm just curious what you'd like to know. You well, I'd like to know, I mean, so... I think he wants to know how it works in a, or interacting with the press office. If I wanted to have David Hicks on this show, or if you wanted to interview David Hicks, who would you go through? And would that be available to you? And how easy is it? And how easy is it? I mean, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, you kind just of... Just start talking and tell me how it works. Imagination's... Okay, I can on. give you an example. Today, I was curious. It's the anniversary of the... It's the anniversary of uh, legalization of backyard chickens in the city. You have to buy a permit. I was curious how many chicken permits have been sold. Uh, this is a database the city has. I emailed the city um, press secretary, the mayor's press secretary, Tammy Hawley. She emailed me back a number. Um, for more important things, you know, you just call and if you can get through, you ask questions. A number meaning a phone number or, a no or the number of licensees? Uh, 
She emailed you back a number. Yeah. Did you need a phone number? Uh, no, she just told me. She found out for me how okay. how many chicken licenses there were. And I can't and remember and off the top of my head. On, I it think it's it's <laughs> thirty. Give us a somewhere scoop. Somewhere around thirty. Give us a scoop. Thirty yeah. chicken licenses. Okay. I'm gonna check right now. <laughs> Happy anniversary to all you chicken people. The, the, and, the, and there was a she she threw in a free tidbit. I didn't ask this, but she said the first renewal came in in the past two or three days. Oh, so there you go. Pretty big. I thought that there's a license, just a year license. Now we're really getting off on another topic. But you know what? We're, we're 41 chicken permits. permits. I'm sorry. There you go. 41. Um, so that's the process for something as simple information. What if we're, we're getting into something that's a little uh, more, more down and dirty and dangerous? Um, something more awkward for the city to talk about. You, you just, yeah, you just, it's same, It's really the same process. You either email and call and, and ask, but, I, but I the don't city know why is... I am asking this Yeah, the, the city is, is very particular, though, about going through the quote-unquote proper channels, and, and that pretty much means going through the mayor's press office, the police department. Departments, different departments have their own um, press people, so if it's a parks issue, the parks have a person... I can I can tell you that's the police have that's evolved over time. This is something that uh, you know it used to be that, that it was much easier to kind of get to a department head, just call in and, and talk with them. Mm -hmm. And I certainly have noticed that uh, that it's much more difficult to to have that quick and easy pick up the phone and call. It, it really does not usually happen in Richmond. And and I can tell you, I was doing a story last year. Uh, it was about the mayor's security detail, and I was curious what other cities of a similar size what kind of security detail they offered the mayor and so I just called a few different cities about the same size of Richmond I'm you know on the phone with Des Moines Iowa you know a reporter from Richmond at a paper that sounds like a fashion magazine and within five minutes I'm on the phone with uh, you know city administrator it's, it just it just depends on the city so that brings a very good question that, that I think is a very good question but it just popped up in my head Charlie's very good question and so I'd like to ask you, Chris, okay. <coughs> I'm going to interview you for a second. I want to go around the table and ask this question. What is worthy of and what does the city of Richmond demand a FOIA request for? So if you wanted to ask about chickens, you got the answer from Tammy in 30 minutes, an hour? Uh, a day. Okay. If you want, who makes the decision, Bill? I'm not even going to ask you, Chris. Who makes the decision Thanks. at this point? You're welcome. Who makes the decision? Because there are times, right, Ned, where you have to file a FOIA request. Well, it just depends on what you want. Like, I just wanted a number. I could have FOIAed the database of chicken licenses and found out where every single chicken license was. It just kind of depends on how dirty you want to get in terms of the, the what exists out there for but example makes I, that determination I, I do in terms of what I ask for if if I just I could I could have very easily filed a FOIA I FOIAed for example uh, the city's pet license database because I was curious how many you know of each breed of dog there was in the city um, it's you know what though, just actually, what you ask for. I am going to answer this there because you go. I, I had, I think that there's a, um, there's a line somewhere, right guys? Well, the line depends on where the agency decides to draw it at any given moment, whether it's convenient, expedient, <laughs> uh, difficult, awkward, um, you know, what kind of political position does it put somebody in to have information disseminated? and. Often, I mean, I, cities are, are very cognizant of the news cycle and, you know, when something becomes news and when it isn't so much news anymore. And FOIA allows for this five or 14 day, or is it, what is it 14? No. Five. They can request five an extension seven, for seven pretty much no reason. So, yeah, an extension. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a five day yeah. and then an additional seven day business days, working days. Right. So, you know, for instance, um, in my own experience, after City Hall, uh, um, Mayor Wilder, Doug Wilder, decided that it was time to remove schools from City Hall. They tried to remove schools from City Hall. As the dust cleared, I asked for any information related to blah, 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 on how that happened from the city side. And it took them exactly 14 days to get it to me. I finally got it. It was a big box. It cost me about, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was like about $600. Um, and it was a big, big box of, of documents. Um, 
And then afterwards, as I was looking through this, I kept seeing these threads that seemed to be leading someplace else, back to schools, actually. And so I decided, well, I'll FOIA for the same thing, but asking for the next step in that conversation that had to do with interaction between the city and certain people at schools in the lead up to it, and in sort of a different time frame. Most of the FOIAs went to the same exact people at the city. They did not, A, require a FOIA for it. I called to ask where they said, oh, we'll get you that. You don't have to worry about FOIAing for it. We'll get it to you. It came to me within uh, three days, wait, and it cost me zero. Sounds arbitrary, doesn't it, Bill? Well, it can be arbitrary, and, and particularly according to... But it's a law. How can a law be arbitrary? Oh, wait a minute. That's right. We live in America. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, in, in most cases, unless it was very wide-ranging, you'd probably just ask for it first and then go through FOIA if you, if you needed to, then you FOIA it. But, uh, and, of course, in many states, you wouldn't have to pay for it like you do in Virginia, but... Uh, that's California sounds like paradise. <laughs> well, I, I think it's worth pointing out that in Virginia, you don't, you, any, you know, written correspondence asking for a document qualifies as a FOIA. So when I email the city's press secretary and say, can I please have this license, database of licenses, then that, that is a FOIA. I don't have to say I invoke the FOIA Act. Isn't verbal, verbal is FOIA as well, isn't it? Yeah. And so legally, if you ask for something, that you've now foia uh, but do you have to be a journalist? No. no. Okay. The FOIA law FOIA applies is. to everybody. Anyway. In Virginia, you do have to be a state resident, however. Yeah, that's true. They decided <laughs> that. That's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, what, two years ago or a year ago, and it had to do with, uh, what was that? It was some organization that was culling data I, for something. I don't know what the origin of it was, but I know, you know, again, that's something that is not true in every state, and they, they try not to invoke it too often because they know you can just get... You know, if it's somebody in North Carolina, they'll just get somebody in Virginia to FOIA it for them. But uh, but it, it but it is limited to people in the state. Silver, do you wish sometimes that you did write for a newspaper or an electro or a, or a? Uh, no. <laughs> Want to think about that? <laughs> Folks, Silver just leaning the microphones, taking lessons from Mr. Ned. Chairman. No. <laughs> Why not? Uh, no, I, I enjoy my freedom, and uh, you know, also I wouldn't be able to get up and talk and comment like I do. Uh, that 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 wouldn't be uh, permissible, I don't think. And uh, you know, I just like it's doing. It's permissible. Things. It's just. Frowned upon. Well, you'd probably be fired by your editor, I would think. Would you be, Ned? Yes. Yes. I like to even <laughs> lean in to say yes. I love this. I just lean in to say yes. <laughs> so you have, you I mean, but, uh, you are also, a unique guy in return in the I fact like, that you like, have a lot of rights. I like working on my own terms, too. You know, I don't have to have this done, so I can upload a meeting like a week after. You have deadlines. You don't yeah. have editors. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm the editor, and I edit this video, so... But you don't have you don't have third party editors. You have no. you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder. No, going, no. Because yeah, it's not, the that thing is, I'm, I'm not really a reporter. You know, I, I upload these videos. I, I create the public access. The public doesn't really know about about the Telegraph.org, but uh, you know they're available there for the public. And even if you just search like City Council videos Richmond, you would come up upon my site very I've easily. Done it often. So, real yeah, quick, just so you know, so over 14 more people know now know about the Telegraph.org after after Great. this broadcast. So. <laughs> more than 14 after that because we we'll post it on Facebook. You're so because that's the new newspaper. You know this? You know I, I read something the other day. It's very interesting that Facebook came up. You know, um, there was a study done that showed that I think it's 30 or 40 percent of the people who were polled in this poll last week said they got their news from Facebook. Now, we know that everything on Facebook is true. Well, I mean, I think, says Abraham Lincoln. I, exactly right. I, I think everybody that was using Facebook, including newspapers, to disseminate that uh, style weekly is, is uh, pretty darn good at it. And Times Dispatch is getting better at it, right? Six is very good at it. The and TV stations really um, kind of knock work. it out of the park. Sure. We get a lot of traffic through Facebook. We were talking about this with Holmberg the other day. Uh, two what? shows ago with Facebook oh. about Facebook and how Facebook plays into to, into uh, news and, and all that but anyway off off on a tangent here um, I think one of the questions I wanted to ask all three of you um, is 
it's, it's about a specific topic, um, and that is um, where do your rights end, and I know your natural inclination is to say na na nowhere, but where does your responsibility begin and your rights end? In other words, where do you stop reporting a story? It's actually a very interesting question. I, mean, I, I think about these things, Chris, before <laughs> I do homework, okay? Where do your rights end? I shouldn't say maybe your rights end. Where do you stop reporting? Ned? I'm not sure I understand, like, where do I stop reporting what? If you know, if, if you find something out that's very personal about a candidate or a public figure, and you don't think that it's part of the story, or you don't think it's something that people need to know about. I, I think he's being too specific. Where do uh, maybe you I have, Chris, where do, where would do, you translate? Where do your journalism ethics um, take precedent over, and your responsibilities as a journalist take precedent over your personal liberties and freedoms of whatever? Well, you have the freedom not to report something. Ah, here we go. You have the freedom not to report something. How do you judge? I think some of this, what he's saying is, I mean, obviously as a reporter you have venue. And venue is something very different than, uh, although everybody seems to have venue now with Facebook, but there's still, uh, even there we're seeing, uh, this is this is such a, a, like a sticky thing to deal with. I mean, you know, if I put something out on Facebook, it's out on Facebook to a lot, a lot of people, especially if it's something that's amusing and, or particularly embarrassing it can go viral or whatever but going back to that question I think what he is saying though is you know when when do you pull back there you go when, yeah. do, you, when do you pull your punch I, I gotcha I, I mean I think like for example the scenario you were spinning Charlie it's it's a conversation with an editor uh, uh, an easier one to answer you know I see someone get hit by a car I'm gonna help the person I'm not gonna take a picture or start interviewing people um, in the <laughs> sort of gray areas in between I'm not sure the fallback on journalism jargon there's news judgment and it's just a sort of personal thing I'm, I'm not sure I can't think of a really good example to, to try to help answer that but I'd like to Silver? Uh, I don't really feel like I have to do that because I'm just turning on the camera at the beginning of the meeting and letting it run and I'm not too chummy with these people, the, our council members. I I know who they are. <laughs> really? And, you know, I don't go say goodbye to them before I leave the council chambers or whatever. I don't want to be too close to them because I'm afraid it will cloud my impartiality or something. I mean, I'm not impartial. But uh, what, if, what would happen if you found out that a certain council person had a, a, a certain peccadillo in their past or a certain peccadillo that was ongoing? Something. I don't care what it is. I just push on Facebook moral. and say, ha, ha. That explanation mark or something. I don't, I don't know. You wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't bring it up. You don't think it's pertinent to the to, to no, no. For folks to know. I, w I would if if I found out something and uh, yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind letting out letting out something about bad about council members. Okay. I don't owe them anything. And B Bill, where this came from for me was um, there was a reporter from Six um, from TBR uh, who left and went. To to uh, DC, I think it was, right? Uh, I don't know who we're talking about. Oh, come on. She found out about the councilman who doesn't live in Richmond. Oh, I uh, went Connors. to Atlanta. You're talking about Katie Beck. Katie Beck, right. Mm -hmm. So Katie Beck finds out that Doug Connor may or may not live, I, I just moved into the microphone, may or may not have lived in the city of Richmond. That his main residence, residence is a legal term, but the place he laid his head at night was in Chesterfield County, quite possibly. Um, she found that important to tell people. Um, you were a journalist, you now teach ethics in journalism, that's why you're last to get this question. Why and when and where and how do you, as a journalist, make that distinction? Because it used to be back in the 60s, JFK, we all pretty well know, had some fun times in the White House. Right. Not with Jackie. Um, and the press didn't report it. They all said, ah, that's just the way it is. Um, that's not like that anymore. So do journal... What do you teach? 
Well, I mean, obviously there there are standards, there are different codes that you can point to that'll that will give you some guidance. But the truth of the matter is that you know real life examples are what it's all about. And you know when you work for an organization, that's when again, you, whether you're a an, a citizen journalist or you're working for an organization, chances are the organization is going to weigh in on your decision. Um, it certainly happened when I was um, a reporter on numerous occasions. Um, I can remember one time I was in South Carolina and we had a fellow down there who was, who was well known in the area and uh, a reporter there found out that he was being investigated by the feds and in the course of finding out more and more and more, uh, which we decided to hold off on until they, in, until they indicted him, but um, in the course of finding that out, he also happens to find out that he has um, some convictions in the past for flashing in local parking lots. And uh, not his lights. Uh, no, not his lights. Okay. Uh, we're talking, you know, the the, uh, the <laughs> Colombo jacket. That, I understand. Uh, I'm just, uh, humorous or Italian but, humorous, Sorry. But but the the, the point that at that at the time that these convictions happened, he was not a well-known person. He became a public figure later. And the question was, do we report these things that are already over and done with? He's paid his debt, whatever it is. Uh, do we report that when it has nothing to do with the current investigation against him? And we had a lot of discussion about this back and forth. And the way it was eventually handled was that um, we reported it in almost in passing near the end of the report when we reported the other charges. We didn't report it as soon as we knew it. Ned? Yeah, well, I, would, I was just thinking about that. Um, I, I would hope, first of all, that any you know reporter who found out a public official was misrepresenting that they actually lived in the city that they were supposed to represent would report that. I would, too. I just right. I, and I couldn't think of another. Well, and, but and so in that process, I was thinking about something else. But it comes down to how germane it is. Like, if I found out a public official was uh, gay and closeted, I, I would, that's not germane to anything. There's no you reason have I would gay, ever. You wouldn't no. have a, a closeted gay official? No. Okay. I had a, it says nothing to do with that. Um, I had a, a, an obituary I wrote one time. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is a former Chesterfield supervisor, and uh, I had just come to the Times Dispatch, was working there, and uh, this, <laughs> this guy, how he continued on as a supervisor and eventually became much beloved, I have no clue because in his past he had, as a supervisor, a number of, of issues, the legal issues. I think he had a conviction or three or something under his belt for things that just you shouldn't do as a, as a you know, representative of, of the general public. Um, and he kept winning. Eventually, I think he didn't because of something else. I don't, I don't remember all the circumstances. I think I remember this. I'm writing an obituary on the man. You know, there's clearly all the people are saying nice things about him. But you can't report on this man dying without mentioning all these other things. So I had to write it. And uh, it was, <laughs> it may have been the most awkward obituary maybe the Times Dispatch ever ran. <laughs> we got a lot of complaints from the family, but I mean, what do you do? You have to report these things, you know? Chris, I think it's about time we wrap things up. Yeah, I just I wanted so. to ask one question as we went around the table. And Chris, since you're a, a working journalist, I thought you might start us off. Uh, what's the first website you open in the morning? It's the first website I open in the morning. Um, Facebook, right? Ned? Twitter. Facebook. Facebook. I still, go to the, I still go to the front door and pick up the Times Dispatch. Well, I do that sorry. too, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's, uh, I, can, I can do Facebook while I'm still in bed. Exactly. I don't have to actually yep. go to the door. Okay. So. Twitter. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, no, we see. We have to oh, look, hey, look, that's a generational thing. All right. That's a generational thing. Anyway, so it's, it is time to wrap up. And I've been again with Bill Oglesby. He's an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University who teaches journalism, law, and ethics. Also with Silver Persinger, he's a longtime citizen, uh, citizen journalist who pays, posts full video coverage of city government meetings and events at Richmond Tele I cannot talk. RichmondTelegraph.org. And for years, he's been bridging this strange divide that we've been talking about today between citizen and journalist. And I'm also with Ned Oliver. He's an associate editor at, at Style Weekly, who covers Richmond government and politics. And, of course, Charlie Deardor, who's got something more to say. Well, I just wanted to ask, because um, during these interviews sometimes, at the end of the interview, uh, people are saying you can find him at. And so, Ned, what is your Twitter handle? 
Pat and Ed Oliver. And that's too easy. That's just so original. And <laughs> <laughs> anybody else with a Twitter handle would you like to? I'm at Charlie Deirdor, and yeah. I hardly ever use Twitter, but go ahead. I think I'm at Dovi Dovi Dovi. All right, and that's that. We're done. So Say that three times real fast. Thanks, guys. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Oh, I try to make it fun. It was good.